where am I now? And what does this mean to me now? And what is this going to mean to me in 10 years? And what is it going to mean to me as I'm, you know, uh, near the end of my flying career too? My first airline job, the first month at my first airline job, I thought, you know, I've wanted this as long as I can remember. <laughs> and I don't like this at all. I do not like this. To be slightly uncomfortable at each previous stepping stone keeps you motivated to move to where you ultimately want to be. Like I said, there's lots of different types of pilots. Some people love the technical aspect of it. Um, uh, some people love the, the camaraderie, the, like a, the language that we speak to each other. Uh, some people um, just, uh, they love to be in the outdoors. They love the scenery. Um, for me, it's just absolutely gorgeous up there. And just, uh, it's, it's like being on your dream golf course or something, you know, it's just, it's awesome. Appreciate uh, oh, you're welcome. You, you coming on and chatting with me a little bit about um, your your job, but even we could touch on your past. You know sure. the the you know what's it like coming up through the ranks and learning how to fly and um, Washington weather, you know sure. things like that, and uh, uh, the life of a pilot. So so Art, let's let's go to the beginning. You're from okay. Anacortes, Washington. Uh, I live there now. I, I I grew up in the La Conner, which is only a few miles away. So, okay. Yeah. Um, and you local. learned to fly where? Uh, my parents had a small plane. So um, from the time that I was uh, little, um, I was uh, in the plane with them. And so um, yeah, I could do some basic things. I could, you know, I kind of uh, got, got to learn the, uh, no, uh, they would, uh, um, I, you know, I knew where Mount Baker was. And so if we were over Seattle, I could see Mount Baker. And, you know, they, if they, my parents would ask me to, you know, fly us home from there, I could point us in the right direction. I love that. There. That's awesome. Yeah. So did you, are you one of those pilots who, since you could remember yourself, you wanted to fly As long airplanes? as I can remember, this is what I wanted to do. And it, it, this is it. Did you ever meet a pilot who fell into it in their 30s? Yes. Yeah. You have? Yeah. Yeah. People are like that all the time. Second careers. Wow. Um, uh, one person, the person that comes to mind is a, um, uh, I, w I was uh, based in Detroit at the time. And this guy was a uh, general contractor in um, in Florida, and I think he was uh, he was coming up on fifty, or he had just turned fifty. Always wanted to do it, and uh, was always interested in it. But his business had done great, and sometimes when you have a good thing, you can't. It's hard to make that shift. Wow! And so um, he just got to a point where he, um, you know, he, I guess he had people in place to help his business keep going. He could step back a little bit, and he just always wanted to do it, and he did it. Interesting, yeah. To, to so me. yeah, so it, it definitely happens. There's, um, um, from what I see out there, um, flying is a total just cross section of America. Just everyone from like all walks. Of life. That's crazy. Um, you know, when you in more entry level jobs, sometimes you'll, you know, be with um, it'd be more of um, you know, like a uniform group where it's you know everyone's uh, younger, just starting out. But um, as you get into jobs where it's a place where you're going to spend the rest of your career, it's definitely a cross-section of America. People yeah. from every, every background, um, you know, you grew up in the country, you grew up in the city, um, you had a job before, you came from the military, you've never been in the military, you don't know anyone that's in the military, or, you know, um, um, yeah, just all, all types. Wow, that's, that's, that to me is a new concept, because as, as yourself, I... Since I could remember myself, I've yeah. always wanted. I was fascinated by airplanes. I remember as a, as a kid, we used to we used to fly overseas. Sure. We had family. We used to visit family in Vegas and New York, and we lived in Israel at the time. So wow. it was a long flight. Okay. And I, uh, you know, I literally, I, I wasn't, I, I didn't sleep in the days leading up to the flight. It was yeah, like, you get excited. I just wanted to, you know, be on airplanes. And on the airplane, and then when it ended, I was like, ah. Uh. But yeah, so so because of that, when I hear of people who go, yeah, in my forties, I fell into it. 
it almost doesn't click, but I guess it's, it happens. It, it happens. It happens. Yeah. And you, Some people it's that way and other people it's a different way. But, wow. Yeah. And you fly with them and that's, that's awesome. So Art, you've been with Alaska for how long? Uh, just over a year and a half. Year and a half. That's awesome. And this is, this is it. It's that major yes. that everyone shoot for. Yes. That's awesome. So let's go as far as your training. We'll go back and we'll kind of move from there in the limited time we have to like just what your experience was and sure. uh, kind of walk through the things. So how old were you when you got your private? Uh, let's see. I was 18, I believe. 18. Um, I, uh, I had flown some. Um, I uh, soloed at 16 in a glider. Okay. Um, and then uh, just shortly after that, the company sold the gliders, and that was kind of the end of it for me until I got into college and, and picked it back up. And then at 18, you got your private private, private license. And it was all through the university. Gotcha. So you mm-hmm. went through a university program? Uh, I went to program. a four-year school. Got uh, it. Did, all the, uh, did an aviation degree with um, uh, all the uh, licenses and ratings. Uh, so how long attached. did that take you? It was, a four, it, it was a four-year program. Four-year, and you got your private instrument, commercial, uh, within those four years. Yeah, commercial, multi, CFI, CFII. Wow, along uh, with a degree. Along with a, a bachelor's degree in aeronautical science. That's awesome. Yeah. So you're 22? Uh, yeah, roughly. It's roughly. like thinking back a ways, but yeah, that's, that's about the right Roughly time around time. 22, and you, you get out with your degree and your four, uh, when I, when all your ratings. And what's next? Do you apply to a flight school to instruct, or do you instruct at that same university? Um, I did. I chose not to instruct at that university. Okay. I um, I came back to this area. Uh, my my school was in Arizona, and I came back to this area, and I went to all the um, um, Part sixty one fixed base operators, and uh, started uh, turning my resumes to all these places. Wow. Um, and that's definitely one way to do it. Um. And there's, yeah, there's some great, great places to work out there. Some great experiences. Uh, in hindsight, for me, I would have instructed at the school that I, that I, or the college I went to, or even another college. I don't think it really made a difference, my college, another college. But what I found for me that I missed was when I got that job at the uh, FBO uh, flight instructing, um, I was the only full-time instructor. Mm. And there were um, four or five other uh, part-time instructors, but they came in, you know, once a week. Oh. And so had I been to the, um, had I been at the university, there would have been, you know, dozens of other people just like me who I could, you know, say, hey, I, I ran into a student and the student, um, you know, had this issue. This was how I was thinking about dealing with it, but... You know, I'm not sure if they're taken to that idea or if mm. it's helping them. You know, how do you, how do you, you know, handle that? Or they could have come to me with a similar issue. And so people to bounce ideas off of, um, I, I think that would have really been helpful. helpful. That, that's the only thing I, I would have changed in that part of my career. Wow. So was this, so you know, the university, university you went to was part 141. Yes. And then you instructed part 61. Part 61, yep. So... How would you, in a few words, um, tell people what the difference between 61 and 141 is? Um, it's, uh, it's more regulation to do a uh, Part 141 school. Because the, the, the school has the higher certification, they're more, it's a little bit more focused, and you seem to, um, um, you know, er- everything is, is, uh, is organized where you go from one step to the next step to the next step to the next step. Sometimes uh, in part 61, it's, uh, it's a little more loose and um, uh, you're kind of just stumbling through it. Not, not, I don't know if stumbling is the right word, but it doesn't flow as smoothly necessarily. Interesting. Or there's a lot more um, inconsistency where, where one, in, uh, one school, you know, one instructor, you know, I, I like to do it this way and it's, you know, it's the way that they love it. Huh. But it's not necessarily, um, it really might just be that person's way of doing it. And huh. you um, you don't kind of see uh, maybe a consensus approach of where lots of people have come together right. and kind of agreed on, yeah, this really this, this way really makes sense. Um, so when you come out of a Part 61 school, depending on who you had, you, know, you may have, it's just a wide range of, you know, what did I really learn from this? Yeah, you yeah. cover some basics, but it... Um, you know, it, there's a lot more, I guess, 
maybe character and personality in your um, instruction than uh, consistency and order. And it's a whole salad it, it's, of, of it's training. A, yeah, they're two very different animals. Interesting. So you instruct, uh, how long you instruct before you get your first, uh, do you go up to 1,500 hours? No, at that time it was before it was before that role. Oh, before that accident yeah. happened. So how much how much did you need at that time? Uh, you know, I'm not sure that there was a minimum. I had um, I had just over 500 total when I got my first airline job with 75 hours of multi. Wow. Yeah. See, you could just you're saying that if an airline liked you at 300 hours, yeah. they could legally hire you. Yeah, as as a first officer now, now a, a captain, you still have to meet the uh, airline transport pilot ATP minimums. Got it. So, so basically, what changed since that accident is all they said is we'll require our FOs to need the ATP as well. Yes, because the ATP was always and, a 1500 hour thing, even right. before the accident. Right. The only thing is the FOs didn't need the ATP. Right. I gotcha. Okay. Right. And so, and they did a couple of different things. At first, they had a uh, uh, second in command type rating. Okay. Um, and then eventually that became, um, you know, let's just give everyone a, uh, captain type rating. So just a, just a regular type rating. We so need, anyone who's sitting in the flight deck will get the, will need to have an ATP. We'll need to have an ATP and type rating. Interesting. Yeah. Got it. So what was your first airline job? Uh, my first airline job was, uh, was uh, Pinnacle Airlines. It was, well, now it's Endeavor and okay. I got there before it was called Pinnacle. It was Express Airlines one at the time. Um, Flying Saab 340s out of Memphis, Tennessee. Wow. So you were living here, instructing up here in the Washington, Seattle area, yep. and then you moved to Tennessee. Right. And so um, I I commuted. That was probably the job I, I um, where I was there the most, or the at, at, or in the, that base the most. Um, so as a commuter, you mean you spent the most time there out of all the places you've commuted right. to in your life. Gotcha. Right. Right. Um, Whereas uh, later I was uh, really serious about commuting. So on my days off, I was always immediately back home. Got it, got it, got um, it, got it. Uh, so I did, I spent a lot of time in Memphis. Wow. So uh, was, did you go from Cessna 172s or whatever you instructed on to the Saab? Yeah. How big of an adjustment is that? It's, uh, uh, so at the time I was instructing in a 152. Oh my God, that's a small, slow airplane. It's small and slow. And the uh, the toughest transition that I ever made in my life was going from the 152 to the Saab 340. And looking back, why do you consider that to be your toughest transition? Because today you fly Boeing 737. So to me, I'm thinking, so why was that the toughest? What about it? Okay, so so two things. Um, the complexity of the systems. Um, and there were a few things that kind of gave me a head start in that area. Where I had uh, had actually previously been through the uh, ground school, the training for the systems, uh, when I was an intern oh. for the same company. Um, so I had seen it before, uh, but the thing that made it the really the hardest was that prior to that, you, you know, you're going ninety knots, huh. um, and now, you know, um, we're going two hundred fifty everywhere you go. Wow, interesting. And so. When you're going 250, things happen faster. faster. And, um, you know, it's, it's really, it's the same things are happening, but you, you change your mindset. Whereas, um, instead of when I'm five miles away from someplace, starting to think about arriving and being there and what am I going to do next for the next steps? Um, um, now, when I when I'm within 200 miles of a place, I'm, I'm like I'm really getting my my ducks in a row to That's arrive. That's funny because you're in right. a 737. So. Right. So so at, there's a one point in your flying career where you think of base things on distance, and then you shift to base things on time. Oh. So they happen at the same time. They just don't happen at the same distance. That's funny. And so that's what gets you behind. Um, your first time on a faster plane is, you know, uh, I, I, my first flight, we were starting the uh, descent and arrival and mentally I had just finished thinking about the, uh, takeoff and climb. Huh? Um, and just things happen fast. Wow. And so, but like I said, they, they happen at the same time. So maybe the mindset shift is to stop thinking about it as a distance and now, if I'm 30 minutes away, I you know from being there, I need to be um, getting ready to arrive 
Interesting. So you're saying sticking with time would be a safer bet than sticking Safe, with distance. Exactly. Got yeah. it. Got yeah, it. but it's but it's a mind shift. I had never thought about that before. Wow. 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 So you're saying the Saab 340 was the from the 152 to the Saab was the largest jump in in uh, speed that you've ever done. Yes. On airplanes. Right. And that's why the that's uh, that's why it was tough. So from there to a uh, CRJ 200 was easy because it was both fast. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So you kind of you know you're like. Pretty much almost the same time frame. Right. Just and, um, and... Um, and I had dealt with uh, airline operations before. Got it. So, yeah, there was not really a whole lot of um, a lot of big things happening. It was just um, different. Interesting. Here's something I'm curious about. Okay. And I just, because sitting through my own training, you know, you, you, as a student, as you know, I'm in the left seat and then the instructor's in the right seat. Mm-hmm. And I always thought this, it just in a funny way. I'm not sure if it even happens or if I'm crazy for thinking that. When you go from instructing, and you didn't do 1,500 hours, but still you had a, I a, a good a little bit, yeah. A good number of hours um, that you instructed. When you get on with your first job at an airline, you go from the right seat in a Cessna instructing to the right seat in the reg- regional airplane yeah. as an FO. Did, does you're still in the mindset of instructing? I'm assuming does like does anything slip out of your mouth so the captains like forgetting that you're not an instructor anymore because you're just so used to it. Um, the biggest thing about instructing um, and even uh, um, flight instructor training was uh, learning to do something and talk about it and discuss it as you're doing it. Oh, and so um, you know that's kind of reaching way back in memories, but I. I'm, I probably talked a lot more about, you know, talked through things a lot more as I was doing them um, than I do now. Interesting. So now you, you just fly and, right. quietly. That's awesome. That's awesome. So you do the sub and then you go to CRJ's uh, Jets 200? Yep. Uh, yeah, I flew the 200. Yeah, and then you kind of move through the thing. How long in total did, did you spend at the regionals? And I know timing probably had a lot to do with it. Yeah, cause... timing had a lot to do with it. So to get to this point in my career, uh, my first um, uh, my first uh, airline job, I was hired in January of 2000. Mm-hmm. So uh, yeah, 18 years to get to this point. Wow. So looking back on it all, but uh, sorry to interrupt, but oh, yeah. the uh, the um, you know timing of the industry, lots of things can happen. It you know it wouldn't necessarily take 18 years for everybody. It was right. Just the, the, at that time and the sequence of events that happened, that's what it took. Wow. Looking back on it all, would you do it again? Um, I don't think I could not do it again. But at the same time, um, it uh, it really takes a lot out of you. Wow. I feel like you have to, um, for most people to get through it, you have to love it. And um, it's uh, it can be a tough road. And wow. so when I see people that are, um, you know, just getting started or they're, you know, you, you can see, you know, the, uh, you know, the look in their eye about it, you know, try to offer some good advice. Right. Um, cause I know it's not an easy road. And if I can, you know, there's lots of people offered me advice along the way. And so if I can pass it along, you're like, wow, I like so to do that. Let's talk about that. Students who fall into it because they think walking through an airport with a hat and the stripes and a bag is cool. It, yeah, it's cool. <laughs> Yeah, it's cool, but let's talk about how they could affect the industry if they do end up pilots in the flight deck, those okay. type of people. How do you see that? Um, why is it so important that you love that versus other jobs? Because if you work in a call center and you hate what you do and you do you get your job done, then you're good. You go mm-hmm. home and the job was performed yeah. and you know the credit card company you work for, they, they got their stuff out of you. Sure. Why is it so important for a pilot, unlike that call center employee, to really be into what they're doing? How could that play out maybe in a negative or even in a positive way if they are excited about it? Um, I think the the part where you have to love it me, is, uh, is less about uh, the technical aspect of it, less about the uh, day-to-day job, and just in the um, uh, sticking out the hardships of the career path. Um, Interesting. I think, I think flying in some ways, uh, I've never been an actor, right? But from what I see of acting from the outside, uh, I, I draw similarities to flying where there's, um, there's a full range of pilots all the way from the, uh, starving actors to the, uh, 
Hollywood A-lists. Wow. And so in flying, it's, it's the same thing. And um, uh, everyone wants to be at the, at the you know, top end and doing, doing you know, well and being where they want to be in their careers. But to get, go from the, um, the starving actor to the A-list can be a tough path. And so that's why you have to love it to stick out that, that uh, career progression, not necessarily the, um, the job. That's- but for me, the job never gets old. For you, the job what? Never gets old. Never gets old. Yeah. Interesting. So it's not the actual flying. Yeah. I which love, I, think, I, which I, I love. I think everyone should love what they do, but you're saying it's the hardships of, it's the bumps in the road as far as the career is yes. concerned. You know, uh, paying your dues, as they call it. Yes, I would that say so. If it's not in your blood, right. it'll be extremely tough. And, and, it, and It would be tough to stick it out at certain points. Wow. 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 So you instruct. Um, doing the airlines, 9-11 happens during your time. So it's, uh, I speak to quite a few pilots at Alaska yeah. and, you know, 9-11 happened and it, it changed a lot, a lot of things as far, things. As, as far as timings is concerned. So I'm assuming Alaska Airlines was always on your mind because you're from the Washington, yes. Washington state. Yeah. So, it meant a big, meant a lot to me. Right. So you, you're one of the, I always say at Alaska, there's, um, I haven't worked for another airline, but as, at Alaska, there's two types of employees. There's the one employee who's, who goes, since I was two years old, I used to look over my backyard and Alaska jets were passing. Mm-hmm. And that's the only airline my, my family flew on. And I always wanted to work for them. And then there's the other type of employee uh, that goes, oh, oh, yeah, I come from Arkansas. I just got hired. I never heard of Alaska, mm-hmm. um, but I was working downtown Seattle and a friend told me to apply and here I am. Right. So it's funny how there's literally those two types mm-hmm. of pools. So you fall into the, the, the pool that has a lot of meaning behind it, which is awesome. So let's talk about, let's fast forward and let's talk about a pilot at a regional sure. with the required hours for a major. Okay. Um, Getting ready. Uh, this is cool because you're not like a captain who's been here for 40 years. So it's a year and a half ago. So it's 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 2017 or 16. Uh, uh, 2017. I was hired. 2017. Yeah. So things probably didn't change all that much. So how does that work? So you're flying at the regionals. You get you have your hours. How do you go about getting on with Alaska? How does that? What does that look like? Um, it looks like. Uh, um, Waiting for the window to open, the application window, getting in your paperwork, and then it's just um, um, maybe it's starting to become less competitive. I'm not sure as, uh, but uh, at the time that I was applying, it was very competitive, and you looked the same as uh, thousands of other applicants. Wow! And so you know you're really trying to find one thing to um, to set you apart. Huh? Um, there's a uh, um, there's a lot of regional pilots out there. And what I found was that even though regional flying is real work and, you know, they're, you're a real pilot when you do it, um, it, uh, because there's so many other people, you just don't stand out. Mm. So that was tough. So it's, you're saying it's a standing out. Thing. Yeah. Finding something to stand out, um, uh, or someone to stand out to. Hmm. Um, I did uh, lots of volunteer work because they um, they like Alaska does they, love they like work. that. I did a lot of uh, vol- uh, school volunteering, um, and I thought as a regional pilot, you know, I maybe I, I don't stand out enough, so I got a job at Allegiant. Oh, nice! I flew uh, MD eighties, um, and I I think that um, just the um, complexity of the airplane and maybe the nostalgia for some some um, People at Alaska that had flown the MD-80 when the MD-80 was at Alaska. Interesting. So um, they sort of kind of identified yeah, with that, was, which is awesome. Which I identified with uh, one of my interviewers about, and we swapped stories about the MD-80. That is awesome. Um, now, when you got on with Allegiant, did you say, I'm doing this to identify with my Alaska interviewer, or it just ended up working in your favor once you were actually, sitting Actually, with um, at that point in my career, I had commuted for a long time, and finding a job... Um, that was going to be here meant a lot to me. Huh. So um, starting out, Allegiant wasn't my number two choice. Right. But in the end, it became my number two choice. And if I hadn't come to Alaska, I think I would have stayed there. Wow. I You know what? I hear that it's a good, uh, it's uh, at least the pilot group. 
is a good. They had a great pilot group. Good pilot group. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the that, I'm not. Yeah, great. Um, a great knowledge base on the uh, on the airplane. A lot of guys have done it for years and years on that particular airplane. Huh. Um. So yeah, learned a lot from them. Wow. So what's the? Um. I know these days you have 1,500 hours. You are with the regionals. What's the competitive number of hours you, a pilot needs to have to be considered by a major? Or we could talk about Alaska. Gosh, that's that's hard to say, and it's changing all the time. Um, as there's five thousand, ten thousand. Uh, I had ten thousand. Wow. But um, I would say five thousand is probably becoming more competitive. So five thousand hours. Yeah, in my, in my estimate. Wow, five thousand hours. You could get on. You could start applying and and, and yeah. looked at. Well, I was looked at it as um, uh, um, don't wait to apply. Uh-huh. Don't wait to get to a certain number of hours to apply. Just Go ahead as as when you're when you get to your your regional airline Start and, and you get settled in a little bit you know get a couple months under your belt get your uh, resume and application together for the next place wow um, and you know just always be pushing to the ne- that next step let them say no instead of you limiting yourself interesting so so for anyone out there who's now at a regional or just got on with a regional who's thinking I'd rather apply once I have the hours and be told yes, then apply without the hours, be told no five times until I have the hours, you're saying that doesn't necessarily make you look bad because within the airline culture... Maybe it doesn't make you look bad. It's it's what's expected. People do that. Um, true. And and um, uh, I think most times, for most people, you don't get hired on your first try. Huh. Even if you did have the hours. Even if you did have the hours. So you're not... And like I was, like I was saying, you know, you even though you... Um, you may be uh, really qualified, mm-hmm. and you know you um, you work hard. You fly some real trips. You deal with you know all the real issues that airline pilots deal with. Um, you know, there's nothing that really sets you apart because all the other guys are dealing with that too. Mm. So um, yeah, a lot of people don't get hired on the first try, and so um, you know keep keep applying. Um, someone might notice that uh, you're persistent. Or they might not, and they just read it the second time, and they take it. Wow. Um, but, yeah, don't don't limit yourself. Interesting. So you show up to the interview. How many people show up with you? Um, let's see. This At, at this uh, interview, there were uh, four, four of the people with me. And then um, the uh, previous uh, company, uh, there were about seven or eight. Gotcha. So you show up, there's four other people with you, and you guys are all in suits and ties. All suits and ties, all similar backgrounds. Um, how do you approach the standing out part? I mean, how do you how do you tackle it? Because you guys all look the same. Say they need two pilots and yeah. four show up. Yeah. How do you, how, how does Art walk in the room saying, okay, I'm, I'll do X, Y, Z to stand Interview out? Interview prep. You're not the first one to say who I heard yeah. that from. Yeah. I sat with um, a pilot who said that. Um, and there's lots of different types of interview prep there's a lot of places that offer you know one-on-one interview prepping you do might do a mock interview but there's also a lot of um personal aspect uh preparing that you can do on your own wow you know it's fascinating because i think it's it's so humbling to hear pilots who say i know how to fly an airplane i'm a professional pilot i'm not a professional interviewee yeah and it's a skill. It, yeah, and and I'll t- I'll I'll put my head down and go through interview prep because I want this job. Yeah. There's so many people. I feel I might be wrong on this. I feel like there 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 would be so many people who would say, "Oh my god, I could fly this million dollar jet. I don't need interview prep, right?" But the two have nothing to do with each other. No. And that is I I think it's so beautiful I think to hear when when people go, "I want this so bad." And I'll do everything it, I could on my end to make sure, sure that I will interview well because I'm a professional pilot. Mm-hmm. But I haven't, I haven't, I don't have the same amount of hours interviewing as yeah. I do flying airplanes. So I think that's pretty cool, and it proved itself to. Oh sure. Today you're you're a pilot with Alaska. Um, one thing to add to that, um, I, I found that uh, once you're at an airline, um, there's lots of different work groups within an airline, and Sometimes, you know, it might be subtle, but each one of them kind of speaks their own language in a way. Mm-hmm. And um, most of the time, you're able to clearly get your point across. 
from one work group to the next. Right. But sometimes it's tough. Uh huh. Or there's um, you know, there's misunderstanding, or you're just coming from a different viewpoint, and you don't quite pick up, you know, what they're saying, or you're not saying what um, they're not. You're saying something, or you're portraying something different than what you think you're portraying or saying. And so the uh, the interview prep kind of really helps you. Um, you're not you're not misleading anybody. Mm. You're just clearly presenting what you're trying to present in a way that it's going to be understood. Absolutely, and, and that's so true with airlines. It's like one big family with a bunch of kids. They're all on the same team. All the same team, <laughs> but a few don't speak each other's language, and you need to communicate. Yep. And it's it becomes uh, it becomes really interesting. So you get hired with Alaska. They say yes yep. to you. They say great. Let's uh, that. What's next? Training date. Um, yeah, it, uh, that's, that's generally the next step. Um, and then for, um, for sometimes it can, it can be, uh, um, we, where you've been hired into a pool. So you've been hired, but they don't have a spot for you to train yet. Oh. Or, or you might be um, given a class date, um, as you were hired. Interesting. So there's kind of two ways that that, that that can happen or, excuse me. You may have the op- opportunity to have uh, to pick from a couple of different options. Oh, um, so with in your situation, they in, give I, you a... in my situation, um, uh, I I picked from a couple of different options, and um, in the end, I don't know if it made much difference, but I was trying to have some integrity and do the right thing, and I just wanted to give my previous employer um, you know, minimum two weeks. Yeah, you know, yeah. I, yeah. I, um, there was a sooner class I could have taken, but I, I deferred just a little bit. Absolutely. And you, it's funny, you mentioned the word sooner and the word seniority jumped in my head yep. because that's why sooner is so important in the airline industry. How about you, in your language, Sure. explain why seniority is such a huge part? Because you have so much, so many years under your belt, not only with one airline and many airlines, mm-hmm. meaning you have you have so much experience in Climbing a seniority ladder for as long as you sure. did, and then starting at okay. at day one at another airline, mm-hmm. and then climbing it again day one, yep. then at Alaska again day one, yep. and now you've been climbing it since 2017. Talk about seniority. Okay. Talk about why someone would want to get on sooner than later, and how does all that play into your day-to-day life? Okay, so seniority, um, whoever's been there the longest gets the first pick. So it really comes down to your, your quality of life. Um, if you want a better schedule, the most senior person gets their first pick. And if you're the least senior or the most junior person, you get the last pick Last pick, and it kind of trickles down. So, um, um, and that goes to vacation, um, everything. Yeah. Pay, pay scales are, 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 are by, um, years of service. So, um, the longer you've been there, the more you get paid, um, Every every aspect of benefits really comes down to seniority. So so when 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 you just said when there I was a... when I just said uh, so sooner and then making that decision between sooner and later. So in that um, in that period of time that I gave up, um, I think two classes. How many are in each class? Twelve people. So there's twenty four people now that. Um, you know, they get to pick their vacation before I get to pick my vacation. And that is huge. And that's, that's huge. If I want that summertime vacation, um, well, if if they picked it, then they picked it and I got what was left over or maybe a different time of the year. Yeah. Or even if if, if 10 years from now, yeah. you know, those people will still be ahead of you. Me. And even if it comes to like a monthly bidding mm-hmm. thing and uh, there's this great Puerto Vallarta trip in the box yep. and one of those 24 people takes it over you, they'll get it before you do. And that is because 10 years ago, you gave your company to, uh, in the sufficient yeah, notice. Trying to, trying to do the right thing. Absolutely. But and it, it but plays it, out. And it could, it, it could cost me. It plays out your entire um, career. So not only those aspects, but then um, um, what if I want to upgrade? Mm. Okay. Well, there's, there's only a certain number of, uh, they call them vacancies, but those are spots available for ca- upgrade to captain. Interesting. And um, every so often they come along. And if you are, um, um, well, you can put in for it and they're awarded on seniority. Huh. And so if, um, you know, it could come down to five or six years from now, uh, when I go to upgrade, 
that uh, one of those guys that was in that two-week period ahead of me, they got it and I didn't. Interesting. So it's it's something that really, um, uh, for good or for bad, and, and yeah. on the flip side of things, if you get on before someone, before the 24, then you get your vacation, you get your Puerto yeah. Vallarta so before So all the people that are, have were hired behind me, um, yeah, I, I get my pick before they get their pick. Yeah, it's, um, it's huge. Or if the, uh, you know, I hope this doesn't ever happen, but if it did and there was a, uh, you know, a market downturn and, you know, furloughs became an issue, um, they furlough by seniority. Yeah. So the most junior guy is furloughed first. Interesting. And so, you know, it could, the cutoff has to be somewhere and it could come down to one person. Absolutely. And, and that person, you know, so like right ahead of you, that guy stayed and you didn't. I've and heard, uh, two weeks that you know I made that choice. That's that's where it stands. It's it, yeah. It's it's everything. I actually heard from a pilot at Alaska saying that I want to reach my last airline the quick as quick as I can. Yeah, good. That's that's very well said. Yeah, I want to. He said my only goal. Should, well, not my only goal, but one of my big goals should be reach your last airline as fast as you can. Yes. Be, and that f- falls into exactly what precisely what we're talking right. about, and that is. Get that ticket seniority number Mm -hmm. in and just ride the wave for Mm -hmm. as long as you can. Because, and not just, I mean, flight attendants, any job with seniority. Any job with seniority, yeah. The sooner you get in, uh, the better off you'll be. Yeah. uh, Um, Overall. Yeah, a couple things with with that. Um, um, First of all, yeah, getting getting there, your seniority, that is the only seniority that is worth something, is the seniority at the company that you ultimately want to be at. Correct. Um, so you may have, um, well, at each one of these other airlines that you went to, hopefully, you know, you only went to one other airline. I went to several. Wow. Yeah. You, um, you but, uh, seniority ladders, but the, uh, it's nice to have some seniority if it happens at, you know, your previous companies, but at the same time, it's almost, um, I see it as almost a bad thing, oh. um, because with seniority, comes comfort Hmm. and you can get into a personal situation where you know i'm feeling pretty comfortable do i want to go back to being the most junior guy do i want to be on reserve that is dangerous which which is um on call to people in the non-airline business um uh do i want those things and i'm fairly comfortable now or have i been here long enough at maybe at a regional that, okay, well, I felt like it was the time to buy a house mm. and I bought a house mm. and then, you know, um, I'm tired of driving my, my rundown car. I'm going to buy a car and you settle and you settle a little bit and you wow. bought some things that, um, require your, um, your captain pay at a regional airline and that, go, you know, making that shift, that one year shift where you were going to take a pay cut potentially, a lot of times that's that's the case. That's going to be a real hardship for you. And and can you do it? Interesting. Yeah. Wow. So you're saying it's so easy to bring yourself to a point where the place you're in turns from a stepping stone to I need this paycheck to pay for my lifestyle. Yes. And now if you leave to a major right seat first officer, you're probably taking a slight pay cut from a yeah. regional captain now how do you support that lifestyle right. and it's i could totally see how people would fall into the trap of oh i'm a captain at a major i could buy that boat or car mm-hmm. boat it's not like they make all that money <laughs> but i could buy a car right sure um uh and so that's a awesome point that yeah. i never thought about because settling probably would be one of the biggest uh, pit yeah. holes that people could right. fall into yeah to think about so it doesn't it's not intuitive but um, to be slightly uncomfortable at each previous stepping stone keeps you motivated to move to where you ultimately want to be. I love that. Yeah. I love it. And how do you know where you want to be? I guess you just know from since, you know, I want to fly with the, for the um, It really comes down to, um, I think, for each person, an individual choice of what's important to them. Mm. Um, for some people, you may want to live in a certain area. Um, maybe because of family or, you know, spouse likes that area or, or whatever. So that, um, that might influence your choice. Um, do, uh, 
the, a decision to do I want to set myself to be able to live in the base where mm. I'm where I'm based, right? Or do I um, um, do I want to be a commuter, and that's going to have you know consequences in in Absolutely. your in your career too? Um, what uh, what types of of operations do I do I feel like I need? Interesting. Do I um, do I want to um, try you know flying you know long haul international type type flights? Yeah. Uh, do I feel like I want to um, collect type ratings on my mm-hmm. certificate? Do I want to fly lots? You know, all the different types. Interesting. And, um, or am I satisfied with um, you know one or two? Um, yeah, there's there's just lots lots of choices to be made out there. Um, and for some people, they might not care where they live, right? And that could open up, you know, more choices for them to look at it as far as where they want to end up. Art, how would you tell someone out there, whether they're they're going through, through flight school or at the regionals trying to research on the majors? Mm-hmm. What would you, uh, maybe it's something you've done this or not? How would you tell someone? How would you advise someone out there to approach this whole research? Um, that they have to tackle on their part that feeds into everything you just said because sure. uh, different airlines are yeah. different uh, they fly different planes they fly different planes uh, they require different things the lifestyle will change dramatically I mean a side of seniority that we touched on sure. every airline has something equally great but very different to sure. offer how would you tell someone out there who eventually wants to end up in the flight deck on a major airline other than airlinepilotcentral.com or whatever that's sure. called, right. how would you tell someone to approach that? Um, think about, spend some time thinking about where you want to be at each step of your life. Um, you know, when you're just starting off, you want to go everywhere, you want to see everything, you want to do everything. And sometimes maybe you're more, more ambitious about, I want to fly all the airplanes. And I want to go all the places, and uh, I want to go there in the winter. I want to go in there in summer. I want to, um, I want to do it all, and I want to do it all all the time. Hmm. And uh, and and that's a valid point. And also, um, you should be thinking about okay. And I like those things now. And how am I going to feel when I'm sixty? Interesting. Because and when I'm sixty, um, I. Uh, I, I guess I really don't know for myself, but I see other people that are further along in their careers, and I look. Well, how are they feeling? Do they like to do um, a really gu- grueling schedule, or mm. do they not like to do a really grueling schedule? Um, I know there have been times in my career where I've done, um, you know, eleven legs and one eleven legs, which is eleven flights in a single day. What? Um, and I can't imagine doing that. Well, I can't imagine doing that now at, uh, you know, just in my 40s. 11 and, flights. And I definitely can't imagine doing it in my 60s. Wow. And, um, you know, I've, I've seen some guys uh, in their 60s that uh, feel like they might need to um, uh, legitimately call in sick once a month just because... Um, the lifestyle, is the lifestyle, yeah, it 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 is taking a toll on them, and they really need, um, <clears throat> and they're not taking advantage of the system. They just they really need those days to uh, be a hundred percent, so that they can be a hundred percent on the flights that they're operating. The safest um, thing a pilot could do is call out sick. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, um, sometimes, sometimes, yeah. 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 And so, uh, yeah, I think it really is important to think about where am I now. And what does this mean to me now? And what is this going to mean to me in 10 years? And what is it going to mean to me as I'm, you know, uh, near the end of my flying career too? Hmm. So think, think about each, each of those steps and, and, and how you're going to feel. And it, sometimes it's hard to know. Absolutely. Um, but uh, if you're, you know, lucky enough to, you know, meet somebody or ask them how are they feeling at this point in their career. Yeah. Let's, for people out there who are curious, because I'm really curious about sure. this. I'm, I'm being a little selfish here, but uh-huh. I really want to know. Take take me or us, everyone, behind the flight deck okay. uh, door on a typical flight. You're sitting in the right seat. Okay. You're briefing. There's the card. You're doing all your checks and stuff. Walk me through a pull off the gate until takeoff. What happens? 
who do you talk to on a, on a major typical airport? Okay. How does that work? As far as to working with a, with a captain, take me behind the scenes and, and maybe walk me through that as best you can because I'm curious. Okay. Yeah. Um, well, uh, the idea is that if you, um, if you prepare, so all the prep work goes into um, before we even push back from the gate, before we even close the door. And, be- and before and, you, and before you take ahead. me behind the curtain, sorry to interrupt. You mentioned the word prepare. I actually was watching a documentary of, a, I think it was a Cathay Pacific sure. pilot, and he said he goes, and I'm curious if you heard this, he said he goes by the five Ps. Okay. Prior preparation prevents poor performance. Yes. Perfect. And so said. when you mentioned prepared, he was actually in the flight deck saying those things, so okay. it kind of rang, rang uh, familiar. So go ahead. Okay. So um, really, that, that's the biggest, biggest, most work-intensive part of the flight, usually. And so um, it gives you a chance to um, uh, trap and mitigate errors. It gives you a chance to um, um, come up with you know how you might deal with with each thing you might run into along the uh, along each issue you might might come up along the flight. Um, so that's really when um, pilots are the busiest. Hmm. There's lots of paperwork to review. Um, uh, being fully knowledgeable about every aspect of the flight. And when you say before, you mean in the flight deck prior to takeoff? or From, from the time that I show up to the airplane, to the airplane until the time that we push back from the gate. That's when most, most stuff happens. That's when I'm the busiest. Wow. Yeah. So you're the busiest on the ground. On the ground. As a pilot. Right. I love that. Right. I love that. And I'm not trying to be uh, less social to no, the... No, no. Uh, uh, to the, the the flight attendants, or, or the, and often the um, you know the um, the captain, they'll they'll all be together doing their their crew brief, absolutely, and I'll have enough time to say hi, I'm Art, and then I'm like I'm in my You're my in office thing. getting uh, getting things together um, while everyone else is still uh, briefing each other. Interesting. It's, That's fascinating because the flight attendant workload really takes place in the air. It does. And yeah, they're pilots, they're the inverse of each other. That is fact. Yeah. How do you approach working so? intimately with a work group that they're inverse from each other the the workload period times how do you how do you deal with that from a pilot's point of view uh i i try to be um i I try to be respectful of um of um the work that they're doing and so um sometimes something might be important enough to interrupt and sometimes it's um not important to interrupt and so if it's not, I try to be respectful of that and then wait until a time when they would be um, uh, maybe done with service, done, have the carts put away, and then, and then call for requests that are less important. Gotcha. Like, like going to the bathroom. Like going to the bathroom, uh, <laughs> refill on coffee, um, those sorts of things. Now, um, uh, anything that's important, uh, it, it's important to have um, free communication between the, the flight deck and the cabin. And so um, flight tenants need to feel like they can call me anytime if they need something, and I call them anytime if I need something from them or if I need a status update or um, there's something that we might be coordinating about. Let's talk about a part of your job, okay. and that is the walk-around. Okay. From an airline stand, I mean, I, I have my private pilot's license. I, I, to me, a walk around is I'm looking. Oh yeah, the elevator, the full this, the whole, the the the, the screws are all in place. The you whole can't thing. reach some of those things. Uh, yeah, there you go. So so, talk about what w- the concept of a walk around at a major airline, seven thirty seven. From okay. an airline's perspective, when you go through training, how do they approach it? How is it looked at? What's expected of you? What what do you do on a walk around? What are you looking for? Okay, um, well. It's a lot of the same things. It's a lot of the same things that you do as a private pilot. It's just things that I can't reach. Uh, so you're just looking. Right. So, um, for instance, uh, as I'm walking uh, along the uh, trailing edge of the wing, um, uh, I can see into the connection points for where the, uh, you know, where the um, ailerons are connected, where flaps are connected. Uh, I, I can see um, that the, uh, the safety pins are in place. Um, I, I, I can see all that stuff. I just can't reach it. So you do. So you go from touching it to just looking at it. Right. Interesting. Um. Uh. Yeah. And we're uh, the things that are um. You know, in uh, in reach. You know, uh, the gear. 
the brake pins, um, uh, bonding straps, um, uh, the uh, lens covers on the lights. Huh. The lights work. Um, there's uh, gauges that are uh, uh, visible in the uh, main wheel well. Uh, I can I can see all those. Uh, I'm looking for um, now. Some things are out of reach, but I can see them as well. And like wiring bundles, uh, everything's connected. I don't see any broken wires. Um, yeah, there's there's a lot of mm. things that uh, you look for. You're looking for um, uh, in the engine. Is you know is there uh, is there any damage to fan blades? Oh, um, is there any? Um, uh, uh, debris in there that shouldn't have been in there you know um uh something that was blowing across the ramp or know. like a bird or a bird or something yeah interesting yeah so looking for bird damage uh-huh. um uh and sometimes you know you might not know that you hit a bird until you until you see where um where it hit because you won't feel it it's, it's yeah you won't plant. necessarily feel it yeah it'll just eat, eat the thing up um yeah it could yeah wow um so yeah, there. Um, you know that usually the evidence of a bird strike would be, um, and it's you know, I, I I don't like to do that because well, it's not good for the, the bird. It's not good for the plane. It's it's just a bad bad situation. Yeah, I don't think that's good for the bird. No, I don't think that's healthy for the bird. It's not it's not healthy for the bird, and and it's not healthy for me. I I don't. I mean, I I don't want to hurt. I don't want to hurt the wildlife. I don't think you know. So I I mean I so I. I I feel bad when that when that happens, but I'm also looking at the um, you know um, okay. Well, how did that affect you know the safety of your plane too? Interesting. Um, and so you would you a lot of times you would see if that did happen, you would see uh, you know maybe uh, feathers, maybe a blood streak. So you could see some and then, you yeah, see some and evidence. Mechanics are looking at it too. Right. So if you had a bird strike, that would require a um, a. Uh, uh, maintenance personnel to inspect Got it. it. So, so, so you're, you're, you, uh, I want, I want to, I want to just curious how, take me behind the scenes when they sure. push off a gate. So you push off a gate. Okay. You're talking to who? The car that pushes the plane back? Uh, we're talking to lots of different people. Okay. Okay. So, and, and, and is the FO and captain talking or, or? So generally the, um, the way that it works is the, uh, the FO would be talking to air traffic control. Okay. And so that could be a number of different people. It could be a, depending on the size of the airport um, and just the way that the airport setup is. So SeaTac, so SeaTac for instance, uh, when we push back, we're talking to ramp control. Okay. And they control the area immediately around the gates. Okay. And then once you leave the ramp, you get out onto taxiways, then you're talking to ground control. So you go from ramp to ground. Mm-hmm. Okay. And then from ground, um, when you've been sequenced for takeoff, then you switch to tower, and you switch to tower when you're uh, lined up, not lined up, but you, when you're waiting to line up on the runway. Right. So um, there would either be um, in in some places there might be a sign that says change over to tower at this point. Oh. Uh, ge- the general rule is when you've been sequenced for takeoff. So um, as a general aviation pilot. Um, generally you do that after you've done your run-up. Right. And you're right. lined up. And so it's, so it seems like it's different, but it really is the same because you're really not ready to be sequenced until you finished your run-up and you get in line. Um. So the key is when you've been sequenced <clears throat> and because it's a jet engine, uh, you don't do run-ups there. It's, it's already run up. It's already uh-huh. operating at the, and at is the, that true across the board? Jet engine, you don't do a run-up? You don't, you don't see, so you just do so in the Saab 340. Do you guys do run-ups? It was a turboprop, so it had a turbine engine, oh. just like a jet, and doesn't require run-up. Fascinating, interesting, and it's always it's always interesting because uh, every so often you'll get a, uh, a general aviation pilot uh, come up and give you a few pointers. Ah. Hey, I noticed you guys didn't do a run-up. But it, <laughs> turboprop, right? It's like but the Q400. Not, right. You don't. Does, no, does not require run. You don't do any of that. No. Wow, very good. And then you take off, and then departure, and then whatever you do the whole thing. Right. So, uh, so take off with tower. They would hand you over to uh, departure, um, uh, or depending on the uh, the airspace, uh, it might go straight to um, the uh, center. So the uh, 
uh, Air Route Traffic Control Center. Yeah, I actually sat, um, spoke to an LA Center guy. Okay, cool. Yeah, and so he uh, twenty, he's done it for twenty two years. Wow, uh, awesome. That was a very interesting, yeah, I interesting bet. conversation. Yeah, wow, cool. So. Look at that. So basically, uh, radios is, yeah. is the, is the, so right. the majority of what you do in the flight deck is fly an airplane and radios. Yeah. And, uh, and, and division of, of duties. So, uh, one person is flying the airplane. Uh, one person is, uh, talking on the radio and, um, managing the, uh, the flight deck. Hmm. Um, and then, uh, if there were an, an emergency situation, uh, one person would be managing the emergency or the, um, you know, the abnormality, because it might not be an emergency, it might just be an abnormality. And then at that point, the um, pilot flying would also be talking on the radios. So it'd be uh, flying the airplane and radios, and then the other person managing the issue. Here's a, an interesting question. Would you, if you'd have to guess, would you say more people have an easier time splitting duties in times of stress, or more humans have an easier time falling into that trap of doing more than they should on their own. Hmm. From your experience, what would you say most people fall into or under? Um, I, th- I think that, um, I think that the division of duties has become more intuitive over time. Um, uh, uh, the history of flying is a learning process and there was a time when, um, uh, aviators had to learn that division of duties uh, was important. And there have been, um, unfortunately, accidents that were caused because of that. And that was the, the, um, the moment that the learning happened that we're not going to do that again. So you're saying 2018, it's more ingrained it's in more aviation ingrained than it ever has. Ever has been, yeah. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. Cool. Um, and then to... Um, um, and it, it's kind of a fine line because um, no one should be out of the loop. So you follow along a little bit with what the other person is doing enough that you would catch um, an error and help each other out in that way. But also um, not getting so wrapped up in what they're doing that your primary objective is to do your role. Hmm. Um, and and so vice versa. So you're kind of trusting the other person to. I'm There's just a trying, balance. Yeah, you're trusting them to do their role, and you're giving them a little bit of backup. And you're doing ro- your role. They're trusting you to do your role, and they're giving you just a little bit of backup. Interesting. And then if you do anything big, then you might say, um, "Hey, hold on just a second with what you're doing. This this just happened. I took care of this, and then." You know, thanks, and go back to what you're doing. Huh. Just, you know, help each other stay in the loop. Interesting. Fascinating. Wow. So we're running out of time, Art. There's there's so much we didn't cover, so much we could cover. This is, I could spend all day long talking about, sure. uh, you know, <laughs> pilot stuff. So what would you, if you could speak to all future major airline pilots, okay. or if you could speak to Art 18 years ago, what would you say? What, what aside of timing, because no one could control nine eleven, no one could control anything. Sure. What would you tell someone who is listening to this conversation, thinking, "Yeah, like this is a confirmation that what I thought about the job, mm-hmm. with the little bit we spoke of it, um, they actually want to pursue and move forward with." What would you tell someone who's who's just starting out? Okay. Um, I would say if if um, if you love it and you want to do it do it and there'll be there's going to be some times when it's going to be tough and you're going to question whether you want to do it um i can think of lots of personal (laughs) times for myself but um and you literally thought i might just jump i might just yeah that you know is my my first airline job the first month at my first airline job i thought you know i've wanted this as long as i can remember (laughs) and i don't like this at all i do not like this and this is awful. Uh, I'm not having a good time. What? That must be a weird uh, mind game because you think to yourself, what in the world was wrong with me for craving this since I could remember yeah. myself? Yeah. Wow. And then um, <clears throat> it all came down to um, um, 
you know, my learning curve going from uh, what we talked about earlier, flying a 152 right. to uh, flying something faster, the Saab 340. Mm-hmm. So there was my learning curve that was happening there. Um, I don't think the, uh, uh, the, the captain and I really clicked with each other. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, I think he was irritated at my learning curve. Mm. Um, and so it was just, it was, um, it was a tough month. And that, and that, you know what? And, and, was... and it was my first month. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, it really had me questioning, do I want to do this? And then, um, um, and it, it took that month to really, you know, make the transition and be up to speed. Mm. And then um, the uh, subsequent month and flying with subsequent people, I was up to speed. Hmm. And, and then all of a sudden I could start to, um, uh, relax a little bit. I can broaden my, um, my field of view and, uh, you know, see and, and do more things and, and kind of enjoy the space a little bit more. Wow. And it totally changed. Um, it, yeah, it was a different, different job within a month. So it sounds like you would tell people, not that everyone would experience, not not, uh, not not that everyone would fly on a Saab 340 and not click with a captain and have this crazy loop to thing and then have a weird first month and then have the second month work out great. Yeah, but whatever it is they're dealing with, it sounds like you're saying stick it through. Yeah, stick it through. And there's and there's moments when you really do question it, um, and it could be for lots of different reasons. Um, but if if you love it, what you, what you want to do, stick with it and and see. You know, wait, wait until you're, you know, a little bit further and then see if it, you know, don't, don't make your judgment right away as once I see something, this is how it is hmm. for the rest of my career because, um, there'll be more airlines. And there'll be more, more airlines. And, um, as you have more seniority, your, your, um, your outlook, your lifestyle, the things that you're doing, um, at work change. Um, and, um, that's one good thing about seniority is, is it's always getting better. It's, it's huge. And so, yeah. So, um, uh, so think about that. If you run into a situation where you're not having a good time and it's tough, you know, that, that may only be a small window in time. So don't make your whole life decision based on that. So you're saying stick it through. Stick it through. Yeah. Stick it through. It's huge. Really important. I, I, I'm trying to ask this of more people I talk to. Art, if you weren't an airline pilot, if you weren't a pilot at all. Yeah. What would you be? What's what's this one thing other than I know if you wanted to fly for the, your entire life? You know, what would I you be? I don't know what I really don't know what I would do. What are you like um, second in line most into? What, what would you like to, to have been? What what, uh, what are you curious about? What did you, I, you know? I I love to travel, so it would have to be something with travel. Um, uh, I feel like I've gotten to a point where this is my skill set, so. and so I don't know what I would do otherwise. Huh. Um. But, uh, yeah, it would have to be something with travel. You'd be a travel blogger. Yes. <laughs> Although I'm not a very good writer, so I don't know if anyone... Oh, would no, you take blog. a video camera and you say, hey, everyone, check out this waterfall I'm at. Yes. And, uh, and then you put the video camera on your face. Right, and, say, and hey, a self- selfie moment. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Cool. Uh, I think I'm trying, to, I'm trying to put myself in shoes of someone who doesn't. I'm, I'm, I have a little... I'm cheating here because okay. I have... Uh, a good number of years under my belt, not as a pilot, but in the airline industry. Okay. So I'm trying to put myself in the shoes of someone who's never been in an airline. Could you be a pilot with a fear? Have you ever met a pilot who had a fear of flying and they overcame it by be- being a pilot? Um, I don't know if it was a fear of flying um, necessarily, but uh, like my personal fears are... Um, being eaten by wild animals and falling from high places. And you're a pilot. And I'm a pilot. Um, you know, I, I guess uh, I feel very different in the airplane versus standing on the edge of a cliff. Huh. Um, I hear that from, there's some flight attendants who, yeah. who still have a fear of flying, but they're but they're cool on a plane. Maybe it's, it's closed. I don't know what that. I don't know. I don't know what that thing is. Here's something, uh, you since you fly for Alaska Airlines, talk about, in a few, in, in not doesn't have to be a crazy uh, uh, in depth answer, but what would you say is the difference between flying and flying in the state of Alaska? Oh, flying in the state of Alaska is awesome. Why? What is it about uh, Alaska as a pilot? You know, um, there's like I said, there's lots of different types of pilots. Some people love the technical aspect of it. Um, uh, some people love the, the camaraderie, the, like a, the language that we speak to each other. 
Uh, some people um, just, uh, they love to be in the outdoors. They love the scenery. Um, for me, it's just absolutely gorgeous up there. And just, uh, it's it's like being on your dream golf course or something, you know? It's just, it's awesome. Yeah, I, yeah. Hear, I hear that from a pilot's point of view, flying in Alaska. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not mundane ever. Interesting. Yeah. Does it, and, and when the weather goes down, when I, on a sunny day, I lived out there, it's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying it's easy because maybe the runways are, it's beautiful. But when the weather's like way shitty, you really see what you're made of as a pilot. Sure. In Alaska. Yeah, and, and you, um, um, you know, when you have a great landing on a uh, runway that's covered in snow or ice, uh, you feel good. You feel good. Yeah, you feel good. And that's a high that stays with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. And it so. keeps showing up every time. Even me, what I mean by that is when you're 60 and you do that, you still get that high. You still feel Not like that. Not just when you're 20. Yeah you, yeah, you always feel like that. And that is... Yeah, that it's, is... Um, in flat fact, every, um, every flight never gets old. It feels the same. It feels just as awesome now as it ever felt. And I was... I, mean, I had a pilot... It's, uh, it's, it feels the best after 10 a.m. and before like, like 3 p.m., <laughs> That's when it feels the best to me. <laughs> so like 1 a.m., 2 a.m., those it ones. It feels less good. It feels less good, but it's still awesome. <laughs> I love that. Here's something I didn't ask you. In all your flying career, any crazy, any emergencies, crazy stories, anything that stands out? Um, yeah, I've had uh, four emergencies. Give um, me your craziest one. Um, uh, well, twice I've been single engine. In, okay. a, in an airliner, so that that would be where we had to uh, shut down one engine for one reason or another. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, the, f- the first one was on a uh, Saab 340. Um, an oil seal failed, so the engine was going to run out of oil. Oh. So to protect the engine, we shut that engine down Okay. Uh, per the uh, checklist. And then... Um, Actually, that day we landed in Paducah, Kentucky, and it, fly, it, it flies just great. It flies great with yeah. one. Fabulous. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Um, and the other one uh, was in a uh, um, CRJ 200. Uh huh. And um, that one had a hot air leak uh, on the, uh, the air coming from the engine, the uh-huh. engine compressor. Um, and uh, so, for, um, for safety, the uh, checklist led us to shut down that engine. And so we flew single engine into uh, Portland, Maine. A jet. Yeah. Yep. Much different flying a turboprop to a jet with one um, engine? No. No. They, they, yeah. They, they fly way. great. Planes are planes. Planes are planes. They fly great. Uh, one engine. It's, it's built to do it. Wow. So just emergencies as far as shutting an engine now, but nothing that you thought, will I make yeah. it home tonight? No. Got it. Um, and so actually uh, on the uh, CRG 200, I was the, the captain on that flight. Um I made an announcement to, to inform people that I would be shutting down the engine. Um, you know, no one needs to be worked up because it's not a, it's not something that's, that's dangerous. It's abnormal and it's weird, but it's not dangerous. How and you... so I didn't want them to, uh, you know, have any fear. Right. Um, and then the flight attendant told me that, you know what, they all slept and they didn't hear your announcement. They didn't hear your announcement. They're all sleeping. That was the and one And I shut good down time. the engine and they, they didn't even notice. Most of them were still sleeping. Oh my God. That's the one time where you're thankful that people don't hear pilot. Cause on the plane, it's known pilots just mumble and whisper sort of right. thing. And here's, I know exactly why, because when a flight attendant makes an announcement, they're both speaking into the mic and hearing the voice off the speaker right. at the same time in the same room. Right. Pilots, when you make an announcement for the cabin, you're speaking into the mic in one room. Yes. And the voice comes over the speaker in another room. Right. So when you make the announcement, yes. you don't hear the feedback live as to a flight attendant does. So if she starts or he starts making an announcement and it's low, they bring it closer. If it's high, they take it away live. Right. right. When a pilot does that, there's no way to know. That's why many times... Sometimes it's too loud. So right. flight attendants will call the pilots and say, hey, the announcer was like crazy loud. But it's because of that because you're some, in a separate... Some of, some of that is the, uh, um, the, the system on certain airplanes can be maybe slightly out of adjustment, yeah. loud, louder from one to the next. Um, there is a uh, volume control where I could select the uh, speaker in the cabin and, um, and hear what I'm saying. Now, now, when I don't have... If I did not have that selected, it's... Um, 
uh, it just it feels funny talking and not hearing anything. Got it. And 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 um, it's it's almost hard to deal with. Where it's, it's you're trying to make sense so of, you guys of what do you're saying. We have the ability to hear. We do have the ability to hear, oh. but since uh, since I'm not always talking over the the PA, primarily I'm talking on the air traffic control radios. Right. Um, what I think might be an appropriate volume on my uh, PA Got might it. not be, or, you know, of what I'm hearing might not be set to the appropriate volume, and so um, it sometimes it's, it's it's trial and error a little bit to, gotcha. to talk and have that adjusted just right where I can hear enough that I I'm talking in a normal voice. That makes sense, yeah, because it's either it's mo- probably every once in a while it's good, but it's sometimes it's low time. Yeah. I always thought that it's you yeah know, if, the vo- if, the, if the if the if the volume selector for the, for the PA is turned off. Then you're just kind of talking into the blind, and you can't hear at all what you're saying. Um, and then, depending on how, if you have it selected, and then how high or low that you have it selected. Interesting. Our last question. Sure. Uh, I, your job has so many aspects to it. There's there's flying airplanes. There's trips. There's layovers. Cities you visit. There's uh, the benefits, uh, flight benefits. There's so many aspects to your job. If you had to pick one, um, being at a major airline. You know, this is, I hope it's your last airline. And yeah, uh, yeah this is, you got in. If you'd have to pick one, what's your favorite thing about your job in general? Out of everything you get along with being an airline pilot, what's the one thing that you just, you love? Uh, people. People. Yeah. I love that. So, um, yeah, I uh, I love having passengers. Uh-huh. So you um, don't want to fly cargo. I don't want to fly cargo. I love that. Same, yeah, same here. The cargo um, never appealed to me, although it's a pilot at an airplane. To me, the people have such so much to do with yeah. that. Yeah, you know what? I really this is one thing that I really love about Alaska Airlines is um, they uh, they have a cargo aspect, and so every once in a while I can get just a little taste of cargo, and that's kind of fun. I love that. And if if I if I did it all the time, I would miss people. Um, but I, I like to kind of try it out every once in a while just for fun. I love it. Um, but, uh, yeah, people make a big difference. Um, huge. Huge difference. It's, uh, it really brings, um, a human aspect to everything you do. Huh. You always have lives in the back that you're flying and you're right. taking around and it's, it's, it's. People to interact with. Absolutely. Um, uh, maybe someone, someone that, uh, a different work group from myself. So if we are doing, um. Uh, lav breaks. Mm-hmm. Um, someone to talk to besides Absolutely. another pilot is kind of is kind of interesting, you know. Um, interesting. I feel like it takes uh, all types in the world. I love that. So people is your. Fa- I love that answer. That's that's beautiful. Cool. Good. Well, we covered what we covered. Hopefully, I'm sure people will find will yeah. find what we did cover helpful. Um, but yeah, I again, I, I so appreciate you coming oh, on. You're welcome. Glad Going to be here. On the way to Anacortes. Yep. And uh, you, you passed recurrent. We didn't talk about recurrent, but we could do that uh, some other time. Okay. If we get a chance to chat. Cool art. Well, thanks hey. for coming on. Thank you very much. Yeah. Enjoyed it. Thanks.